since we originally set this conversation up, much has changed. COVID-19 is wreaking havoc on world economies, people's jobs and lives are being lost, and the Olympics are postponed. We're all in a bit of a holding pattern. So, Kate, how are you holding up in California? Yeah, things are going pretty well here. It's obviously a bit of a crazy time, but luckily for cyclists, we can uh, can keep riding both indoors and outdoors and set up a little home gym. So we're in a pretty uh, good spot for now. Good. Glad to hear that. And uh, Coach Miller, how are things in Colorado? We're not doing too bad either. Uh, we still can ride outside, which is nice. Uh, also set up a little home gym and started doing p45 with my wife nice. i'm getting my butt kicked uh, <laughs> so yeah it's all right uh, we're good. doing good no I'm, I'm i'm glad to hear that I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that and as our audience can tell this this episode is, is going to be a little different than previous shows because we have two guests today uh the first is kate courtney and the second is her coach jim miller so kate can you tell our audience a bit more about yourself? Hi, yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm a professional mountain bike racer. I spend most of my time trying to go fast on bikes and get Jim to tell me I did a good job. Simple, <laughs> very simple. <laughs> and Jim, can uh, you've been coaching for a while. Can you tell us a little bit more about who you are? Yeah, um, I have been coaching for a while. You can't coach for a while if you're not getting old. <laughs> that's true something like that <laughs> <laughs> um yeah long long coaching history i guess uh we're getting there um i come from a long line of coaches my dad was a coach my grandpa was a coach my uncle was a coach it seems like everybody in my family is a coach uh, i never intended to get in the company business uh but here i am and and uh still enjoying it <laughs> well, that's awesome. I mean, I honestly did not know that about the family lineage of the Millers. So that's, uh, I'm learning something here too. That's, that's great. Uh, well, again, welcome. And thank you both for uh, taking time uh, during a, a crazy period of, of our lives in, in world history, truly. Um, but it's going to be fun to, to, to chat about where we're at right now, uh, both uh, with COVID-19 going on and with our athletic pursuits. So uh, first, I'll turn to you, Kate. I know that on other podcasts, you, you've talked about the mental game of training and racing. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that today. But as you and I formed up this idea of where this conversation would go, we thought it'd be pretty valuable and, and fun for our listeners to get insights to the process of how you do what you do with your coach and in Jim, who plays a pretty big role in all of that. So uh, before we get into that process and maybe some of the, the, the mind game, let's first start with how this coach-athlete relationship started. Uh, Jim, or uh, sorry, Kate, how did you get connected with Coach Miller? Yeah, I, I definitely love um, that we're able to bring some of the village together on this call. I think for me, since I uh, started racing I've been trying to kind of find that dream team and and put the right people around me to guide me towards my goals and when I was a junior I actually uh, went out to visit USA Cycling and I remember printing out some spreadsheets of all my power data at the time and going into a meeting with Jim uh, with my dad and we actually kind of requested to meet with him just to find out you know what could I be doing differently what was I doing well did I have potential in the sport? And he uh, imparted a little bit of wisdom that guided my training over the next few years. And then a few years later, I had the chance to start working with him, which was, of course, a dream and a, a very easy thing to say yes to. <laughs> That's awesome. And Jim, what, you know, you're, you're in front of a lot of athletes, and uh, you probably have the luxury of choosing who you want to work with. So what made you decide to start working with Kate? back then yeah uh it's funny i think i get too much credit sometimes uh kate was kate was always interesting i would I'd watch results i would see her race uh and just paid attention was always asking mark Golickson, who's national mountain bike program director about her and, and what her story was uh i saw her race at colorado springs 
there was a pro XCT one year <clears throat> and I was standing with Mark and I'm like, I was like, did she come to altitude? It was like a, uh, this was the start. I was like, she come to altitude and Mark's like, nope. I'm like, wow, that's ballsy to go that hard off the start line at 7,000 feet. Uh, but I like it. And at the time it was, it was like Leah Davidson. She was world championship medalist. Uh, uh, I'll forget everybody who was there then, but nonetheless, I was impressed. Georgia Gold is who I was trying to think of. Mm -hmm. uh, Chloe Woodruff, I was like, that's just impressive. Uh, and probably maybe six months after that, Kate called and asked if uh, she'd come out to the office and, and talk training, which I'll talk training with anybody. And I will talk training all day long. Uh, <laughs> and and typically when somebody comes, wants to come talk training, then I'll ask for some training files, generally ask them to share a training peaks account and just start really breaking down what they've done and, and get an idea of, of who they are and what they've done. Uh, and about a week before she came out, her dad sent me a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet was like exa almost exactly what I would have done. And I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> it was, it was just really impressive. And, uh, they came in and we had a great chat. And for me, generally, uh, I know pretty quickly if I'll jive with somebody or not. And I will almost make my decision on whether or not I think we can communicate well together. Uh, beyond all the data, beyond all the metrics, it it's always comes down to whether or not I think I can communicate with them. And yeah, with Kate, it was like super easy and she's easy to talk to anyway. She's fun. She works hard. There's, there's nothing to dislike. Gotcha. And why is that communication piece so important to you as a coach? Um, cause it tells you, it, it fills in all the gaps, right? Uh, you can look at all the training data. You can look at, there's so much data and metrics. You, you can choose what you want to look at and what means something to you and how you base your decisions. But it's one thing to have an idea of what you think you're looking at. It's another thing to listen to what they have to say and how they interpret the ride and how they interpret uh, the feelings of those rides or races. And, and their story is really what makes the data useful to me. Yeah. Well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense because, again, when we talked about the coach-athlete relationship, which – this episode will focus on, I mean, that, that it's truly a relationship and in relationships, there needs to be well-established communication channels and in a, um, in a way to do that. And I think that the relationship will flourish if the communication is strong and it won't if, if it's not. So, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's huge. That's really huge. Yeah. Um, and Kate, would you say that he's, he's a good communicator? Is he holding up that end of the bargain? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think, uh, Joe and I are texting basically every day, whether it's memes or actual very important training information. Uh, but for me, I think, you know, Jim is a coach who's able to integrate that number side, which I think I am more, um, you know, focused on. I've, I've always loved the numbers. I grew up that, that guy who made the spreadsheet is my dad and he, he was an analyst. So for me, the numbers come easy and they really direct what I'm doing, but learning to understand the role of that interpretation side and um, integrating who I am as a person and how I feel and life stress or other things that might be going on into this plan um, is something that Jim has really taught me how to do over the last few years. I like that as any good coach should do. Um, so let's, let's, kind of pivot to mindset because again, uh, Kate, I know it's, it's a topic you've, you've, talked about in other podcasts, I think is crucial to an athlete's mind, uh, to an athlete's success. And it's well established that, you know, having a strong mindset, um, will help an athlete flourish. In fact, in a previous episode, I did talk to, uh, Jim about this. Uh, how has Jim played a role in developing that mindset or, or has he throughout your career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for me, that's always been a big focus. I think there's, you know, a certain amount of grit and fight that you're born with. But beyond that, when you get to the elite levels of racing, it's something that you have to work on and train and 
think about. Um, and I think the best opportunity to do that is in your training. Um, and Jim really does, you know, make training serious when it needs to be serious and fun when it can be fun. And that for me has been a big transition. And also I think in some ways, a little bit of a secret weapon in that, um, when I'm out on a workout that is supposed to be a race level intensity, hard workout, it is all business. Expectations are high. Phone calls are not answered. Jim will decline me if I call him uh, and, and make sure that I'm, you know, leaving it all out there. But on the days when it's an active recovery ride or just an easy, fun mountain bike ride, I can really enjoy it and focus and play. Um, and I think both of those things are really important to being a well-rounded athlete and being able to turn it on when it counts and deliver in those high pressure moments without wasting a lot of energy on, you know, maybe an active recovery ride. You could be staring at your power meter all day and, and wasting a lot of mental energy or using that as a recovery period. And I think Jim is really good at, you know, making the big, big days and the big games count, but uh, also allowing it to be fun and sustainable. And Jim, have you, have you always taken that approach with every athlete in terms of like, Hey man, if I, if there are intervals in and this is business time, it is time to dig in or is it just something unique with Kate? Yeah, it's pretty consistent, but you know, the thing with bike racing and bike riding is it's gotta be fun. And you started doing that yeah. because it was fun and, and you do intervals and you do structured workouts because you have to. Nobody would choose to do that. Uh, For sure. That's where the, the, that's where the gains are. And, right. and like Kate said, when it's, when it's time to go to work, you have to go to work. You have to, you have to punch in and, and get it done. And then there's days where you don't have to, and you can just enjoy it and, and not worry about it. And an hour 15 is the same as an hour 30, to be honest. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty loose with that approach. I, I do see a lot of training programs and I see a lot of, of uh, structure workouts, coaches, coaches, right. And I have to say, man, half the time, if I was a bike racer and I got this stuff day in, day out, I would have quit at 20. It just did, does not look fun to me. Uh, <laughs> yep. so, so I really like, I mean, you can work hard and, and, and have fun at the same time. Uh, but there, there is time to have fun with it. Just enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and in terms of keeping it fun, I mean, do, is it is it something where you've got a specific recipe, Jim, that you're looking at where you prescribe or communicate on training peaks or, uh, I don't know, on text message or something like that to, to make it fun for Kate? Or is it like she just knows that interval time is go time? Yeah, now she's got it. Uh yeah. And Kate would probably agree. She would probably laugh. I think when we first started, she would, she wanted to go hard all the time. And I spent more time trying to stop her from going hard than going hard. So it's kind of like when you let the reins go, she would go. Um, Typical. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's yeah. True. But I also like, I think what was interesting about that is I could have a ride that was easy, but I would want to do such a good job on my zone one ride that I would just use all my mental energy, like, pinning a certain power number and a certain cadence and trying to do everything perfectly. Um, and I think Jim, you know, as you said, our 15 is the same as our 30. I think, you know, as an athlete, we have to believe that, you know, that extra 1% makes a difference. And I think as a junior for me, it was all about learning to be disciplined and never to cut a corner and never to ride 15 minutes short. Um, but right now, all that matters to me is, you know, winning a world cup. And to win a World Cup, you don't have to do a certain power number. You have to do enough power so that other people can't do it. Um, and I think Jim does a really good job of preparing you to go all in and rise above in those occasions. Um, but to also know that, you know, there is flexibility. So if I ride a little shorter on my active recovery day, but I have more energy to push 10 more watts on my hardest interval the next day, those are the gains that make a difference at the top level. Um, and it's, it's about learning to kind of make those distinctions. Gotcha. Yeah, that's good. I think mental energy too, is a, you have a fuel tank of mental, mental energy. And if you spend, if you burn it all, then it's done. 
And if you can manage that fuel tank, you can get a lot further into the season. And like Kay said, when it's time to, to really go deep, you can go deep because you have enough fuel in the tank to do it. So how do you, how do you train your mental fuel tank? Are, are there... <laughs> So it's an interesting <laughs> analogy, huh? Yeah, no, it's yeah. A, it's a wonderful analogy, and we're we're kind of going off script here. But like, <laughs> what what are what's you know if we need to increase Kate's uh, MFTP, which is actually a thing, but M stands for mental in this case. Um, <laughs> how how what intervals do we do for that? In other words, like, do you guys do you guys spend time on the mindset or self talk, or what, what do you guys do to train the upstairs situation? Okay. Yeah, I think some of it I do on my own. I work with a sports psychologist. I meditate. I do all those things. But I think also just having the understanding that Jim recognizes that as an important part of training has been really helpful. Um, so I think the best example is my happy hour rides. I'll do rides <laughs> at you know 5 or 6 p.m. when my boyfriend gets off work and our buddies are all around and we ride for like 45 minutes to an hour on the mountain bikes. And Jim we'll put that on my schedule anytime I ask. Um, like if I rode six hours that day, if I rode no hours that day, I can always do the happy hour ride because it just refills my fuel tank. It's nothing but fun. I'm like clocked out of the office. I'm just going for a ride with my buddies. And I think little things like that, you know, it might be different for different people. But for me, that's an example of something that you know, whether or not it's critical to training that day, it can really make a difference in how I recover and how much fun I'm having. Yeah, that's, that's huge. That that's huge. And Jim, anything that you want to add to that? Yeah, it's, that's, that's really good. And, and if I, if I used another story, I, do you remember in the nineties with, with Tudor Bompa? Yeah. And yeah. you went from energy system to energy system and, and, uh, there was a period of time where you did VO2s before you did LTs because you would have some lactate buffering capacity to do yep. better LT efforts, and then you'd follow yep. more of VO2s. And that was like, he, he was gold. And I did that stuff. But by the time you get to May, you're like so mentally fried that you yep. couldn't dig deep in races, and you, you get, you'd find yourself rolling out the back because you just couldn't, you couldn't do any more mentally. And this is where I think the communication is really the, the big piece. Uh, I can hear in Kate's voice when she's talking to me, even, even tone or uh, deflection or whatever, uh, when she's tired. And she, everything in the metrics, whoop, uh, HRV, resting heart rate, CTL, ATL, TSP, all of it can be good. And I can hear that, that she's tired. And th this is why the, the communications is so important and that rapport is important. Um, it's, not, it's not that I have this, you know, great ear for hearing these things. It's that we talk enough that I, I, can, I know when she's tired and, and we can stop. This, this COVID thing was really interesting because as that started to, to blow up and we're starting to lose races and shut down, uh, we stopped training almost immediately. Just like, hey, look, stop. And it wasn't because we had this great insight of what was going to happen over the next two weeks. It was just the, the mental stress of, of taking this all in that I could hear her. She wasn't capable of training that week. So I'm just like, hey, look, let's just bail on this. Let's take an easy week, see what happens, and, and see how it develops, and we'll go from there. The wallowing week, as we call it. Yes, the wallowing week. <laughs> It's good. It's, it's a good name for it. Yeah. Good name Wallowing's for it. okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think that's actually an important thing to know at this time. Like I think so many athletes with goals being moved and especially people that were chasing the Olympics are kind of doubling down right now. And if that feels good, if that's right, like, okay. But you know, for me, I'm definitely someone who needs to be full throttle or resting. Uh, and so that was the right choice to really get me back into training feeling really confident and rested and mentally ready for what might be a long period of uncertainty. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And on your, on your Instagram, you recently posted something, but you just keep showing up. And as you and Jim kind of 
re-aim for Tokyo as is postponed. What what does keep showing up? What does that mean to you right now, Kate? Yeah, for me, I think the Olympics being moved was definitely something I had to process. And I think it was really good that I took the time to process that and, you know, be bummed about it and, you know, more in the kind of year not going quite the way we hoped. Um, but also then being able to refocus and say, you know, my long-term goal has not changed. My long-term goal is to stand on that start line in Tokyo as prepared as possible um, to compete for my country. And that goal, you know, there's a way to work towards it each and every day, even though we don't know exactly what's on the horizon. Um, so for me, keep showing up is about, you know, just trusting the process and more importantly, trusting my coach. I think in this kind of a scenario, it's easy to let things go a little haywire and not know how to respond to um, what is kind of an unprecedented situation for most coaches and athletes. We've dealt with adversity in the past, you know, maybe having to move a race or uh, change a goal with an injury or not feeling well, but we've never had to just train with no idea of what races are safe and what races are off. Um, but if there's anyone who can do that really successfully and who knows how to work with me um, to make sure that I'm ready when we do get to race again, it's Jim. So keep showing up for me right now means just getting up every day and working on things that I can use this time as an opportunity to improve and just following the plan. And Jim, how does this, how does this change the lead in for Kate to Tokyo? Um, I don't know. I think you're, I think I'm always evaluating what I would do differently or I'm always thinking ahead. Like if I had a chance to do that again, I would do this. Uh, and I can sometimes be my own harshest critic. Most of the time I'm my own harshest critic and most of the time too hard on myself uh, because I absolutely dislike making errors. Um, but I'd always have this kind of running tally in my mind of what, what I would do different. And this is just a do over. Uh, that's it. And then a chance to, to have another crack at a few things that I thought we would do differently. So it's, uh, it doesn't change anything. It's the, it's the same goal. It's just a new date. Right. Uh, and we just start over. Yeah. I like that. I, I like that a lot. And that's, it, it's also, uh, also the way I would view it as well in terms of, uh, for any athlete leading into it. And, but regardless, it's still, probably perceived by a lot of your teammates, Kate, and other Olympic hopefuls as a setback or some sort of failure. And I, and I think that athletes, I mean, you go through this long enough coaching or being an athlete, you, you have failures and setbacks. And when Jim talked about that mental fuel tank, I think that the big, you know, the bigger that mental fuel tank is, um, the better you can handle failures and setbacks. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's kind of dive into how failure in setbacks has developed you, Kate, as an athlete. Yeah, I think failure and setbacks are always part of the game. Um, oftentimes they might just be, you know, smaller within the team failures or setbacks, not meeting a goal I wanted or performing the way I hoped in races. Um, but I think one thing that's really helpful about having a coach that you trust and, and have such a good dialogue with is that I think we're always able to identify them for what they are. And that's something that for me can kind of spiral out of control. Maybe I have a failure at a race and I lose confidence and this and that. Um, but Jim is always able to really like see things clearly in the bigger picture. Uh, for example, this right now, you know, having this uncertainty you can look at it as a failure or a setback, or you can just look at it as a change and take the time you need to adapt to the emotions of that change and then hit the ground running, ready to play the game, which is going to be a little different. Uh, and for me, being able to have a coach that I can kind of work through those things with and figure out, okay, what is this teaching us? What can we do better? Like, how great is it that I get to repeat training that I thought went really well but could go better next year. Um, and that we get another year to learn about the conditions in Tokyo and the specific things that I can do to perform best there. Um, so I think a lot of it 
comes to how you respond to it and how you interpret and learn from whatever comes up in your career. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, Jim, what it, what does an athlete need most during times like this of failure, setback, whether they lost a big race, um, the Olympics have been postponed. Is there a go-to thing that you do? No, I think just move on quickly. Uh, I actually like talking about failure and setback. Uh, nobody likes to fail. Nobody enjoys it. It's not a pleasant experience. Uh, but it's where you learn the most. It's where, it's where you, you grow. It's where you get better. Um, and I think it's entirely possible to, to fail without being a failure. And, and I think it, it's really important to know the difference. Uh, if you allow yourself to fail and you can fail, that means you're at a point where you can take risk and take chances. And if you have a relationship with an athlete or an athlete has a relationship with a coach where both people are allowed to fail uh, without being failures, then you're really dangerous because, because then the two of you are going to take risks. Right. When you take risks, that's where the good stuff comes from. Uh, if you're so tied up in, in failings and in not allowing failing fail, failures to happen, uh, you won't take risks and then you won't, you won't reach your maximum potential. You won't go to the edge. You won't, you won't find out exactly how good you can be. So, uh, when I think of failures and setbacks, I'm just like, okay, look, they happen. Uh, you're not going to be perfect in bike racing. You're certainly not going to win every race you ever start. Um, if anything, bike racing teaches you, it's to how to fail. Um, but I think the most important thing with failing is quickly moving on. Okay, it happens. Review it, debrief it, analyze it, think about it, talk about it, uh, and then move on. And, and okay. I think with, yeah, I think with Kate, uh, she's also the same mindset. It's like, okay, we can be, we can both be really, upset sometimes with failures and, and be pissed but 24 hours later it's just like bam straight on to the next thing um, yeah i love the 24 well or jim always has the 24 hour rule of uh you're allowed to process it and think about it and i think that is something really interesting jim that you said that i don't think a lot of coaches appreciate is you do say you know move on recalibrate learn from it but you also do allow that 24 hours of being really bummed and thinking about what we could have done differently. And I think for me as an athlete, that processing time, and sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's a week, like with the Olympics. Uh, but that processing time is what allows you to emerge from a failure, not only with like key learnings, but with the right mindset to take action on them. So for me, understanding what part I played in a failure, what I could have done differently, how we could work together better as a team, what might go differently in the future, and acknowledging that we really want to win and we're really bummed about this gives you that time to kind of, you know, redefine your resolve, reset your goals, and emerge from it really motivated to execute on all of those changes. Yeah, I, I think it's, man, without that evaluation time it's uh, the the failure or the win is almost lost and i have the same 24-hour window with my athletes and, and here's the thing anybody can get experience it's evaluated experience that actually moves us forward right are you thinking about how you lost are you thinking about how you won are you thinking about how you could have won better more differently mm -hmm. um and that's where I, I think just observe you know listening to you two talk right now i mean you get you guys are doing that <laughs> to an nth degree. I mean, it's awesome to hear that. Yeah. I'll tell you the other thing that's interesting too is we think the same way when she wins. She's, How's that? You're, you're evaluating what you would have done differently. I'm always thinking could have been bigger, could have a gap been bigger. Right. Uh, what if she had done this? What if this, she, you know, executed this tactic? Um, things like this in my mind are always playing out where I'm like, okay, that could have been better and that could have been better too. Uh, you can still enjoy the success for 24 hours, mm -hmm. but yeah. then you're back to work and, and you're moving on. So for, for me, I mean, winning is much more comfortable so you can smile all day long than, than when you fail. But really the thought process is almost the same. And, and 
and how you evaluate and how you measure it and how you think about it and, and dissect it and debrief it. When, so this is, I, I want to go into a, a Kate's story here and Kate, uh, you don't even know that I was going to say this because um, you didn't even know me at the time, but I believe, I believe this was snowshoe uh, tw- uh, God, two years ago, maybe where you just oh, nationals, nationals. Yeah. Uh, where you just completely decimated the field, probably like three, four, five, five, I mean, minutes off the front of anyone else and big hitters in that field too. But you were just charging so hard. And I remember, so I was in the pit, I was with uh, orange seal team uh, with pace and Amy and uh, Brad, the mechanic, Brad was there and we're sitting there and I was getting lap times and pretty, pretty soon Brad's just like, no, we don't need lap times. And your mom was going crazy and worried about the sunglasses <laughs> and she dropped them and I cleaned them and gave it to her. But like the entire time your face, your face was the same thing, charging hard up that hill through the tech zone, like not looking back, not concerned about that. And just like all the chips were in. Did you, did you know that that was what you wanted to do going into that race? Like the risk of just like, I'm pinning it, I'm going for it. And all the chips were in from the get-go or were you, was there any other calculation going on? Yeah. I mean, there's always a strategy. I love you. you mentioned my mom. My mom actually Your mom's awesome, by the most way. most nervous. <laughs> like I didn't realize this until this year, but my mom gets most nervous when I'm off the front, which you would think would not be it. Oh, really? But at Leger, I was like a minute and a half off the front in a World Cup, and she like threw up. She couldn't handle it. (laughs) She's like, what if she gets a flat? Like, I'm like, mom, I can always get a flat. I'm way more comfortable a minute and a half off the front. Like, I don't know why. She was a train wreck that day. I was like, exactly. she she could like, she could break her bike in (laughs) half and still win right now. Like, (laughs) but no, I think um, for me, that kind of shows like bike racing isn't just about winning for me. Like it's not exactly about what position I'm in. It's about giving my absolute best performance. Um, and I think, you know, when Jim was talking about whatever altitude race, I think I remember that race actually, uh, where I went out so hot, I think I like completely exploded in that race. Like Mm -hmm. I do in many. Um, but I think that that is, you know, who I am as a racer. I'm going out to, see what might be possible to see what I'm capable of to push my limits and test what I might be able to achieve. And that's not just in terms of who I can beat. It's in terms of, you know, what power numbers I can do. Can my lap times be consistent? Can I finish stronger than I started? Um, Could I climb faster? What if someone else gets faster? Can I beat them in the future? Uh, Those are the things that really motivate me as an athlete. And I think that's what Jim and I have worked on a lot is, you know, making sure that I'm training hard enough and that I'm strong enough that I can go out with absolutely all I have and hopefully not explode in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that same race in Colorado Springs too. And I, uh, I was there with a different team at the time that I remember uh, all of us were sitting in the pit and we're like, whoa, does she know what she's doing right now? <laughs> the answer's no. The answer's no. But it's, in an interesting like way, it. like that's For what sure. I loved when I first started working with Jim is I had all these coaches when I was a junior who would say, you need to not go out as hard. You need to not go out as hard. And I was saying, well, I'm going out with the leaders and I want to win. So uh, I'm not really understanding what you're saying here. Uh, <laughs> and what Jim said was that you just need to be stronger so that you can sustain going that hard. And I was like, this is my guy. Tell me what I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to that point, and it's the same thing, like the same thing I do in my own coaching, where I think so many people are either afraid, afraid of failure, which is ridiculous, or they really want to pace well, or they're waiting for the opportune time and all this kind of stuff. And then they miss, you know, they miss the break, they, they don't go out, they don't get the whole shot, they get blocked up in the back of mountain bike racing, and, and their failure is not trying, not going for it. And I would always push my athlete to be a little bit more risky and go for it rather than hold back and, and just choose failure anyway. So again, 
I think we're all on the same page here. I like it. <laughs> um, you, you, Kate, you mentioned um, power data laps uh, in terms of speed, heart rate. We talked about whoop, wearables, all this kind of stuff. You use a lot of data in your training. What can you talk to us about like what role uh, all of that data plays and how Jim helps you kind of decipher through it? Yeah, I think I've always been a numbers gal. I love seeing incremental progress. And I think, you know, earlier we were talking about those big wins and failures. And, you know, the reason Jim and I have so much uh, experience with that is because we're doing it all year long, like setting a new power record or getting, uh, you know, reaching a new level on a workout, those things happen monthly and we celebrate them or, you know, see lags in my performance and know we need to do something differently or that I'm tired and I need a break. Um, and I think having that level of feedback is what allows us to really adjust and adapt and try to push that edge. Um, and that's something that I think Jim does really well is uses all of that data to stay on top of everything. Um, and be able to push me to my limit. And that's what we do at some of these huge training camps at the beginning of the year. I'm completely on the limit, on the edge, but I trust that Jim, Jim knows exactly where that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I don't. <laughs> and sometimes I just perish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we had a funny story earlier in the year. Uh, I flew to... Sicily for a trek Segafredo camp. Oh, and she this has a workout. Is the worst. <laughs> this is a workout. It was just it was just uh, like a zone two ride. It wasn't Was it though? No. <laughs> it wasn't uh, uh, it shouldn't have it didn't cause any red flags in my my mind. So I get on a plane, fly to Milan. As soon as we land or I start getting internet. I start, I get, start getting these texts and there's this one of the crossbones and skull and it's like, I'm dead. And I look at it and I'm like, what is she talking about? And I pop, quickly open up Training Peaks uh, app, look at the workout. And then I realized that, that I had messed up the FTP or the percentage that she's yeah. riding the FTP. Yeah, yeah. She ends up doing like four hours at, at like 88% of FTP. Was, and I'm just like in customs line, like, oh God, what did I do? How did that <laughs> happen? And I call her. Incredible. And I don't, the first thing I say straight away, I'm just like, I'm so sorry. It was my mistake. You don't suck. I'm like, <laughs> I, I could not apologize enough that day. <laughs> I was like, Jim, am I just really bad? <laughs> you use the schedule or the, the workout tool and didn't you, Jim? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, there's a caveat to the story, which is that I usually like, if something feels wrong, I'll always text Jim. And I'm like, hey, uh, I'm 20 minutes in. This seems pretty, pretty hard. <laughs> and I texted him the number I was doing and he texts back and says, no, yep. do oh. it. <laughs> oh, Jim, now the story's changing here a little bit. <laughs> yep, well, so I had... <laughs> clarified later he the workout got switched it was a whole thing but that was a bit of a it's okay I I reset my ability to suffer there was like one of the clients I had to like stop on the side of the road and cry for a minute and then I was like no Jim said to do it I'm gonna keep going <laughs> yep you got it no problem <laughs> incredible <laughs> well well I'm glad this only happened once hopefully but uh we're all, <laughs> since we're all okay well we're all better for it and One we're all better time, for <laughs> but it was also very character building <laughs> that's what we're all about here character building mindset and and data so jim when 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 kate does these brutal hard workouts four hours at 88 percent at ftp for example um <laughs> when you're when you're collecting the data uh, what's one of the, like the main data metric that you are looking at for insights to an athlete? Now I, I understand that there's multiple dimensions 
to mm. what we're looking at here, but if you could like distill it down to like one thing that you're looking at for Kate post-workout, what would that be? <sighs> that is a really tough question. Um, it really depends on the workout, right? I mean, that's the professional answers. It depends. Yeah, for sure. It always, it always depends. Uh, if the, if it's a, if it's a basic endurance workout, if it's zone, if it's a zone two workout, if it's, it's strength and endurance, you're, you're looking at something different all the time for each one of those, those events. If I would discuss like really how I think about training, uh, I really look at, at, at fitness and form uh, and it sounds kind of cliche, but, but when you have really good fitness, like as a bike racer, you've had, you, you, you have great fitness. All of a sudden, if you're a climber, you can sprint and you can time trial and you can do all these things that you normally can't do very well. If you're a sprinter, all of a sudden you're climbing pretty well. You're making the first groups. You're doing things that you typically haven't done. Uh, so I'm really about building a really high level of fitness and then specializing in uh, work or demands of future races or specializing in uh, environmental conditions, whatever it's going to be, altitude, heat, cold, uh, whatever it is. And, and those are the little pieces that make the difference. But the big block for me is always fitness and building fitness. And once you have fitness, you own it. It's, it's money in the bank, uh, provided you don't take on so much fatigue with that, which is debt that, that all of a sudden your asset debt ratio is wrong. So as long as the asset debt ratio is really positive for you, then you can maintain a really high level of fitness for a really long time. It's a solid answer. I like that. Uh, and to you, Kate, what would, if you could distill down one metric that you're looking at from your own data to either confirm or, or deny uh, fitness performance, like what are, what are you looking at? Is it a cop out if I say the same thing? <laughs> it's not a cop out. In fact, I unfortunately you were good. my CTL looks a little bit like the stock market right now. But uh, I think <laughs> over. <laughs> Come on, anything looks better than that. <laughs> yeah, but that's Trump's fault. <laughs> over the past few years, I think that's something that uh, has really made a difference for me. Is just understanding how to build that base and to really push it and see what I'm capable of building in terms of. Um, overall fitness. And I think that's something where, you know, three years ago, I could have never imagined doing the numbers or the volume that I'm doing now. And that like kind of overall base fitness coming up over the years is I think one of the things that's made the biggest difference. Yeah, no, that's, that's a solid answer. And, and truth be told, I thought you were going to say, oh, whatever Jim tells me to look at. So that's <laughs> I love my data. I'm like, Jim, have you seen this? <laughs> she's on top of it for sure she, nice. can talk, she can talk data with anybody nice nice well guys throughout throughout the process of training uh i want to ask each of you what you appreciate most about each other and, and it's i mean this is sure this can be a you know kumbaya okay, this is great but i think it's important to ask the question um what you kate what do you appreciate most about working with jim this is good kumbaya question. It is. Yeah. I would say my first instinct, I think what I appreciate most, which is hard to pick from many things that I appreciate, but is Jim's vision. I think ever since I started working with him, ever since I, you know, walked into that room with my stupid spreadsheets and like my 10 hours a week of training, Jim has seen potential in me that went far beyond what I could have imagined. And not only did he believe in that vision, but he saw the steps to getting there and dove straight into making those steps happen. Um, and I think for me at each step in my career, I've you know, never gotten to the end of his vision. He always has a next big goal that we can work towards together. And I think when we reach it, it's you know, a thing that we get to do as a team. Um, and when you go all in on something like that, it's, it's a really special thing to win. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. And, and Jim, I'll, I'll pose the same question yeah. to you. Uh, what do you what do you value most about working with Kate? Uh, I'll tell you a quick story first. When we when we had that meeting, she came in with the spreadsheets and she left. Yeah. Uh, Mark Gullickson was sitting in there too, and he's he's like, "What do you think?" 
And I'm like, I think that girl's going to be a world champion. And at that point, we hadn't had a world champion in 20 years. And I'm like, I think that girl's going to be a world champion. And Mark's like, of course, Mark is like, great, we need one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the thing with coaching is, is this. You, you have to challenge your athletes all the time. And you have to push them. You have to get them out of their comfort zone. But you also have to remember how uncomfortable that is. In, in your daily job, if somebody's pushing you and they're taking you out of the comfort zone all the time, it's, it's not always fun and exciting. Uh, you realize that on the other side of that, yes, there's going to be, there can be great outcomes as well. Uh, but you have to remember that that's not always a positive experience. Uh, but I think as a coach, if you're going to challenge people and you're going to push them to these, these far uncomfortable corners, you also have to accept that challenge back. And what I really like about Kate is she will challenge me. And I know that if I don't have my T's crossed and my I's dotted, that she's going to find me. She's going to call me out on it. Uh, so I, I really, when I think about her training, I think about it, uh, you know, in terms of a big vision where we're trying to get. But also that knowing that that, that challenge is coming back if I haven't really thought through the, the various steps or ideas or principles, then, then uh, I'm going to get challenged. And I actually really appreciate that because she's, she's not afraid to, to call it out if it's not right. Yeah, and, and that's how a relationship should work, right? A good one. A good one, yeah. Is this counseling for us? <laughs> Secretly, yeah, Kate. So Jim contacted me and said, we need, a, yeah, we need a little session here. So this is what we're doing. <laughs> this is, yeah, we're just getting all our, uh, our T's crossed and our I's dotted before, uh, before next year. Hope, yeah. Well, we're, when we have them all dotted and crossed, we're dangerous. That's Ooh. true. Watch That's out. True. Trophy hunting. Well, okay. So we'll, we'll get away from the kumbaya session, you guys, but um, uh, I do appreciate you guys uh, coming on board. But before I let you guys go, I want to close out with uh, a few questions and I'll, I'll ask each of you uh, some of these takeaway questions. And the, the purpose of these questions is to give our listeners some actionable items that they can apply to their training right away or could just be kind of like fun fodder for, uh, for thought while we're COVIDing and quarantining and uh, sheltering in place. So uh, with that being said, are you guys ready for the first question? I'm ready. Okay. To you both, and I'll just say, Jim, let's have you go first. Uh, what advice can you give to our audience about how to navigate failure and setbacks? Just address them. Take them head on. They full happen. tilt. Full tilt. Take them on head on. Yep. They happen. Move on. Yeah. Boom. And Kate, what do you think? Uh, find the opportunity in every obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> and then keep moving. Do what Jim said. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, I was going to say in our other episode, Jim, we were talking about opportunity and I said something about striking when the opportunity is there and Jim just pauses. He's like, opportunities everywhere. And I was like, oh, God, that's so true. <laughs> right? There we go. Just do what Jim says. That's my best advice. <laughs> perfect. Okay, perfect. Uh, what question. I tell you today, I'm like, in all crisis, there's opportunity. You just have to lift your head up. That's it. Take a look around. <laughs> you can also look at the same thing with bike racing. When it rains, 98 out of 100 people put their head down so the water doesn't splash in their face. The two people mm -hmm. with their head up see the attack. Exactly. Question two, Kate, what is your favorite at home gym workout now as you are sheltering in place? Ooh, yeah, we, uh, we turned our garage into a little gym. So that's been really helpful. Uh, and my PT let me steal a bunch of gym equipment. So we're good to go. Uh, I would say I've been, you know, doing the same workouts at home, but my PT uh, Matt Smith from Ever Athlete has been doing a series of like circuits and a lot of it is the work that we do together, you know, both in terms of integrating into my strength program, but mostly in terms of injury prevention, PT. Um, so that's 
that's a good resource, I would say, if anyone is looking for good cycling related circuits to do at home. Love it. And Jim, you mentioned that you were getting swole uh, just before this. What, what's your favorite gym stuff that you're doing right now? Oh, huge. <laughs> Quarantine uh, jacked. <laughs> Quarantine jacked all the way. Uh, actually, I do so much endurance sport, my endurance sports my entire life that doing this P45 stuff has actually been really, really hard, but really, really fun. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it surprised me and it surprised me how damn hard it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think for us endurance folk, I mean, it doesn't really matter what program, what methodology, what, whatever is to start doing something. Mm-hmm. You'll probably be sore the next day. And that's, that's a good stepping, yeah. uh, stepping stone. So, um, okay. Final question. This one has a statement beforehand, but Kate, I'll have you go first. Uh, continually getting the most out of yourself can be very rewarding, but can also be one of the most challenging endeavors an athlete takes on. How do you, how have you fallen in love with the process of always striving to be your best? That's a good one. I think I've always been drawn to it. I've loved individual sports ever since I was a little kid, uh, partially because there's just always something that you can identify that you can improve on. So no matter how fast you are, there's going to be someone who's faster. No matter how good you are at descending, there's going to be someone who's faster. Uh, And you can always find that angle um, where you can see yourself changing. And I think for me, that keeps me coming back to it. And uh, also riding your bike is really fun. So we can just all agree on that. (laughs) I fully agree with that. Fully agree with that. Uh, Coach Miller, I pose the same question to you, but in line with coaching. So you're always, you said you don't, you know, you don't like screwing up. You want the best out of yourself and out of your athletes. But how have you fallen in love with the process of striving to be your best? I think you have to like the process. Uh, the, the end results, they are what they are. Sometimes they're going to work out. Sometimes they're not. But it's the, it's the process of figuring out how to make somebody go fast, what, what levers you can pull, what, what buttons to push, what works for them. Uh, that's fun. And whether it's been, I mean, I've, I've done it all, right? I've coached on the track. I've coached mountain bike athletes, cyclocross athletes, road, time trial. Uh, they're all different beasts. Uh, but that challenge of figuring out how to make somebody go fast, that's, that's what's really fun. It's a wonderful answer. I like that. I like that. Well, you two, uh, thank you again for taking time uh, during during your life and in this crazy time that we're in right now. Uh, for our audience who want to keep tabs on you and follow you on the socials, Kate, where can they find you? Kate plus fate. Kate plus fate. <laughs> yeah, Instagram is probably the, the best one. Yeah. I've been on there a little more during quarantine times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, Coach Miller, where can they find you? Both Twitter and Instagram are now Jim Miller time. Jim Ooh. Miller time. Awesome. All righty. Well, thank you guys once again for being part of the Train Right podcast. Yes. Thank you, Adam. Awesome. Thank you. Bye.